Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting me to present this webinar. Um, my name is Austin Larson. I'm a pediatrician and a metabolic geneticist. Uh, I work at Children's Hospital Colorado. I'm on the faculty at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. Um, and my colleague, uh, James Weisfeld Adams, um, participated in the uh, drafting of the paper that we're going to talk about this evening. So those are the 2017 management guidelines for cobalamin-related remethylation disorders and MTHFR deficiency. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, um, I, I personally did not uh, participate in the drafting of this document. However, I do use it quite frequently in my clinical practice, and uh, having Dr. Weisfeld Adams as a colleague uh, means that we have a special interest in, in these disorders here in our clinic. Um, so so uh, I can definitely say that having a document like this is really invaluable as a, as a clinician. Um, this particular document not only uh, compiles expert recommendations, but also um, uh, provides the evidence that those are based on and assesses the strength of that evidence. So um, having all those things in one place uh, really does make for uh, more educated clinicians and better patient care. Um, so this is a, a fairly detailed uh, presentation. Uh, I'm going to go through the recommendations from this uh, document and the reason that those recommendations were made. Um, it'll go fairly quickly, but hopefully you'll have uh, the PowerPoint slide available or the, the paper available uh, to you to refer to uh, in the future. Um, but my goal is for this to, is, uh, to provide an, an introduction to this document with this talk. So um, we are mainly talking about disorders of uh, B12 metabolism um, plus one other disorder, uh, MTHFR deficiency. Um, as many of you know, uh, vitamin B12 is part of uh, our typical diet. Um, most folks who don't have a, a vegan diet or um, some other significant uh, dietary restrictions uh, get a, uh, an adequate amount of B12 in the diet. Um, that dietary B12 needs to uh, be absorbed in the intestine. Um, it goes into the circulation, goes into cells. Within the cells, it goes into the lysosome. Uh, and then that vitamin B12 or cobalamin is uh, modified in one of two ways uh, to form its uh, active enzyme um, cofactors, uh, cofactors being uh, molecules that help an enzyme in the body to, to function or improve its efficiency. So um, the ways that you can modify vitamin B12 are to add a methyl group, so that makes methylcobalamin. Uh, that's most of what we'll be talking about today. That's a cofactor for the enzyme methionine synthase, which is necessary for making homocysteine into methionine. Um, the other modification to vitamin B12 is adenosylcobalamin, uh, is forming it into adenosylcobalamin, which is the cofactor for an enzyme called methylmalonyl-CoA mutase. Um, that's an enzyme that's in the mitochondrion. It's uh, kind of a, a fundamental part of energy metabolism. Uh, we're going to be talking a little bit less about that, although it will come up uh, in the uh, context of the combined cobalamin disorders, primarily cobalamin C. Um, and uh, um, so we will, uh, to some degree, touch on, um, on that aspect of, of cobalamin metabolism as well. Uh, the term remethylation defects re refers to those disorders that inhibit the conversion of homocysteine into methionine. Um, so, um, as I mentioned, there are both uh, there are separate disorders of methylcobalamin meta metabolism, adenosylcobalamin metabolism, and uh, combined disorders that affect both methylcobalamin and adenosylcobalamin. Um, we will talk about those as, as kind of two separate categories. Um, and uh, importantly, the combined disorders and the disorders of adenosylcobalamin result in the accumulation of something called methylmalonic acid. And that metabolite is detectable in a blood spot at 24 hours of life, which makes it uh, amenable to newborn screening. Uh, for technical reasons, it's more difficult to identify homocysteine in that blood spot at 24 hours of life. Uh, it's a less stable molecule, so uh, the remethylation disorders are uh, 
the isolated remethylation disorders are typically not identified on newborn screening, whereas the combined disorders in the isolated adenosyl cobalamin disorders are identified on newborn screening. Incidentally, we also identify a lot of patients with B12 deficiency on newborn screening. So there are a couple of related pathways to talk about. We, um, we talked about how uh, cobalamin has a, a role in uh, activating methionine synthase, um, but there's another pathway as well that is required, and that's related to folate metabolism. Um, and then um, many of you, I think, will be familiar with the condition classical homocystinuria, which is caused by um, cystothionine beta synthase deficiency. Um, the important distinction between the remethylation disorders and cystothionine beta synthase deficiency is that in classical homocystinuria, you have an elevation of both homocysteine and methionine, whereas in the remethylation disorders, you have a deficiency of methionine and an elevation in homocysteine. Um, as you can see here, um, methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase deficiency, or MTHFR, um, participates in the metabolism of the uh, vitamin folate, uh, and folate uh, is a second cofactor, or a, a modified form of folate is a, a second cofactor that's necessary for methionine synthase. So for that reason, the methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase deficiency also results in an elevation in, of homocysteine. So because of that, these, uh, these two groups of disorders are um, put together for this set of recommendations. Um, functionally, we're really going to be kind of talking about three sets of recommendations. So one recommendation for methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase deficiency, which I will just call MTHFR from now on. Um, one recommendation for covalent C because it has some of its own um, considerations and then um, kind of some other recommendations for the cobalamin E, G, and D. Um, so those three, those three categories. Um, so this is, the, uh, this is the, the paper that was put together. Um, it was published in the Journal of Inherited Metabolic Diseases uh, in 2017. Uh, this was an expert committee, and the, the authors on the paper um, probably names that, that some of you will recognize. Uh, including uh, Dr. Weisfeld Adams, um, put together a consensus statement based on all of the available evidence. Um, and uh, as we talked about, there, there are the kind of three categories of, of disorders that, uh, that have recommendations here, cobalamin C, MTHFR deficiency, and then the other uh, remethylation cobalamin disorders. So um, why do we need a document like this? Um, one reason is that, that rare diseases are uh, difficult to study. So uh, unlike, say, stroke or heart attack or type 2 diabetes, um, patients are few and far between, uh, and we need collaborative uh, um, interactions in order to be able to uh, really accurately define these conditions and, and study them. So um, in this case, the EHOD consortium is a, an international group um, representing 20 countries, 75 different sites, three of which are in the United States. So that's uh, our group here in Denver, as well as the metabolic groups in Philadelphia and Washington, D.C. So um, one of the things that the, the group is really hoping to do is to figure out what it is about these metabolic um, conditions that causes the clinical symptoms that we see. Is it an accumulation of homocysteine? Is it a deficiency of methionine? Is it a um, byproduct of that, which is an uh, impairment of methylation capacity and increased oxidative stress? Are there other things? How do we account for the kind of unique features of cobalamin C uh, as opposed to some of the other disorders? Or is it all of the above, all of the above, which is um, very likely to be the right answer? So a little bit of evidence for each of those um, forms of the pathogenesis of these conditions, um, it's pretty clear that uh, high levels of homocysteine in and of itself is a, um, uh, is a toxic, uh, that homocysteine is, itself is, is toxic. Um, we know that uh, patients that have uh, sustained uh, very elevated levels of, of homocysteine have a predisposition to thrombotic complications or blood clots. Um, we know that there are some um, uh, developmental changes that occur with really persistently elevated levels of homocysteine. 
Um, we can also then use the isolated uh, disorders that result in elevated methylmalonic acid to uh, understand some of the toxicities in that pathway. So um, those patients that have isolated elevations in methylmalonic acid, uh, they tend to have uh, renal failure, uh, often in their teenage or young adult years. Um, the optic nerves uh, atrophy and they, they lose vision. Um, there can be some heart rhythm abnormalities and uh, there are developmental, um, typically developmental delays that go along with that disorder. Um, thinking about some of the deficiencies that you see as opposed to the excesses or toxicities. So in the remethylation disorders, I, I mentioned that you have an excess of homocysteine, but you also have a deficiency of, of methionine. If you have a deficiency of methionine, then you also have a deficiency of the downstream product of that called S-adenosylmethionine, or SAM-E. Um, SAM-E is uh, really critical for uh, a, a whole host of different um, what are called methylation reactions. Um, a methyl group is a, a single carbon and, and three hydrogens, and it's one of the most basic modifications that you can make to many of the organic molecules in the body, such as DNA, RNA, protein, fat. Um, all of those uh, will require the methyl transferase reaction. So um, it's uh, intuitive that having a deficiency of, of methionine and SAMe would um, have uh, pretty widespread consequences in the body. Um, similarly, 5-methyltetrahydrofolate uh, uh, seems to be really critical for neurologic development, and um, the patients with severe methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase deficiency have the most severe developmental delays of um, the different uh, conditions that we're going to talk about tonight. Um, there's also this concept of, of oxidative stress, which is uh, probably something that, that everyone here has, has heard of in some capacity. Um, free radicals are um, these uh, uh, molecules in the body that um, are very reactive. They um, are too reactive, so they um, interact with other molecules in, in damaging ways. Um, and uh, the remethylation disorders uh, do increase oxidative stress, and that's uh, probably responsible for some of the manifestations of the conditions that we see. Um, so um, the, the real crux of this is the question of which clinical symptoms are characteristic of these disorders. So when do we try to diagnose the remethylation disorders? What do we use to diagnose them? So what biochemical markers, what genetic tests do we have, um, and uh, how should they be used most effectively. Once the conditions are diagnosed, um, are there prognostic factors that we can look at? Um, so depending on which specific remethylation disorder is present, um, do we know then um, which organs we need to have surveillance of? Um, do we know an expected developmental outcome? Do we know an expected lifespan for that disorder? Um, and then critically, what can we do to change that? How can we improve the natural history of these conditions? Um, how can we prevent those manifestations over time? Um, so um, this is the, the crux of these recommendations, and um, we'll go into great detail about um, the ways to do each of these things. So um, one of the, the tables, uh, this is kind of the main table of the diagnostic section of this paper, uh, is uh, just the signs and symptoms that have been associated with um, all of the different um, remethylation cobalamin disorders and MTHFR deficiency. Uh, and uh, I'll just draw your attention to a couple things in this table. So the, the number of, of plus signs is uh, an indicator of how prevalent that particular manifestation is in the condition. Um, and then uh, just uh, looking at the manifestations of cobalamin C, you can see that um, Cobalamin C is sort of the most variable uh, of, of these conditions, and it, it affects the most, um, the most organs of the body. Um, the other uh, cobalamin-related remethylation disorders kind of have a, a cluster of, of mainly neurologic symptoms and hematologic symptoms, um, and MTHFR deficiency really is primarily a neurologic condition, although with a, a smattering of other manifestations. Uh, cobalamin C is by far the most common of the cobalamin-related remethylation disorders. And MTHFR deficiency is, is somewhat less common 
than that, but both are far more common than the, um, than the rarer um, cobalamin metabolism disorders. Um, so, uh, as I mentioned, the, the um, number of pluses kind of tells you what the characteristic presentation of, of the disorder is. So, feeding difficulties and failure to thrive, um, and then uh, retinopathy or optic atrophy leading to visual impairment, uh, as well as some developmental changes are uh, really classic, the classic presentation of, of cobalamin C. Um, in, in going through the evidence uh, that is published, there's really a different, different strengths of evidence. So not all publications are created equal. And uh, the group that put these recommendations together uh, really did a nice job of assessing the strength of the evidence, characterizing it as high, moderate, or low. Um, another way to kind of think of that is, as a clinician, is the, the high, um, the high, uh, high evidence, high strength evidence is something that is just standard of care. It's always done, no matter where you are in the world. Um, moderate strength of evidence, those are things that are probably done. Uh, and low strength of evidence are, are things that are really debatable as to whether those are, um, should be part of care. They're definitely considerations to be made, but they're not, uh, they shouldn't be considered standard of care. Um, how do you assess strength of evidence? So um, one thing to think about is with a particular publication type, what is the risk of bias? So um, when I talk with patients who have a new diagnosis of a particular disorder, um, I make sure to mention something called ascertainment bias or publication bias, which is that um, the patients that are published in the literature are, are published for a reason. Um, so often there's something unusual uh, about the, the particular case that ends up in the literature. Um, it's more severe or has a, an unusual manifestation. Um, and therefore, we, we feel like in general there's a little bit of an ascertainment bias towards um, uh, providing a kind of a more severe picture of each condition uh, if you just look at the, at the publications that exist. Um, you think about study designs, um, so, you know, the, the gold standard, as, as most people will know, is a, a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial. That very rarely happens in, um, in metabolics, although um, we are starting to have um, more of that study design in, in place. Um, but some of the kind of traditional treatments uh, for many metabolic disorders have not been studied that way. Um, however, we do have... Um, you know, if, if something has been in use for, for decades, uh, we can see how consistent the results that we expect are. We can see uh, if there's a large magnitude effect. We can see if there's a dose-response relationship. So if a little bit of something is good, is more better, um, that's a pretty, pretty good indicator that a, a particular intervention is um, working the way that we think it is. Uh, Case reports and case series are considered low quality because they are um, subject to uh, pretty significant bias, as I mentioned, um, ascertainment bias and, and publication bias, as well as um, placebo effects and things like that. Um, so critically for these disorders, um, they're, they're not uh, particularly specific or distinct. So there are very few clinicians out there that have the experience to immediately clinically identify a remethylation disorder at first presentation. Um, more commonly, um, patients may be identified as having developmental delays um, and then uh, kind of, uh, you know, go through a, a typical evaluation by a, um, a general pediatrician, a developmental pediatrician, maybe a neurologist. Um, typically, it's quite a while before a, a patient is um, seen in a, in a genetics or a, a metabolics clinic. Um, but some of the things Things that, that might clue you into a, a remethylation disorder um, as being distinct from the kind of much larger category of, uh, of children with developmental delays are the presence of anemia, so we'll, we'll focus on that. Um, the, the other neurologic signs are, are fairly, I would say, nonspecific, so um, seizures often accompany developmental delay, low muscle tone often accompanies developmental delay. Visual impairment is a little bit more specific, and that's... Um, really mostly cobalamin C, um, where we'll talk about uh, visual impairment. And then, uh, again, cobalamin C has these uh, kind of unique presentations sometimes with um, what's called atypical hemolytic uremic syndrome, which is a, a kidney disorder. 
Um, these variations can be quite variable. Um, some of them can be really sudden. Um, so a, a patient may be generally well, but then um, become sick and have a um, kind of an acute crisis uh, type of onset. More commonly, it, it'll be, uh, as I mentioned, more of a more of a chronic presentation with developmental delay. Um, so um, the clinical patterns to to think of for the combined uh, uh, remethylation disorders, and, and I'm really just going to focus on cobalamin C because it's so much more common than the others. Um, but um, so most patients typically have a, a normal birth weight. There's nothing identified prenatally, although um, feeding difficulties are pretty common in the neonatal period. Uh, about 75% of patients um, before newborn screening um, would uh, be ascertained um, by being lethargic or, or floppy, meaning low muscle tone maybe seizures, um, often with some anemia, uh, low, blood, low white blood cell count. Um, at least half of patients have, uh, or about half of patients have visual impairment in infancy. Uh, another significant proportion will develop visual impairment as they get older. Um, there are uh, these kind of, as I mentioned, the kind of acute crises that, that can happen in cobalamin C that really is not present in the other disorders. So that's uh, termed microangiopathy, um, which is a, a technical term meaning that the small blood vessels are affected by many, many, many small clots um, in all of the small blood vessels of the body. Um, that can affect the kidneys and the lungs predominantly. Um, and uh, so the, the neurologic presentation may be developmental delay that's apparent in childhood, or it may be more of a um, psychiatric or behavioral presentation and the, the milder manifestations of cobalamin C. Um, for the isolated remethylation defects, um, the features are a little bit more specific uh, to the to the neurologic system and the um, and the hematologic system with um, fewer of the other manifestations of cobalamin C. Um, typically, it's a, a neurologic presentation. Um, but uh, with the addition of um, uh, anemia um, and um, abnormalities of the complete blood count. Um, visual impairments are much less common in cobalamin C. And again, you know, in most conditions that affect the, uh, the brain, the milder end of the spectrum manifests as uh, what's initially considered to be psychiatric disease rather than a neurologic presentation. Um, depending on the newborn screening that's done, and that, that varies country by country and state by state, um, most of these disorders are not likely to be diagnosed on newborn screening, unlike uh, cobalamin C and the other combined disorders. MTHFR deficiency is a, um, a little bit different, so it's typically a more severe neurologic presentation earlier in life, um, so it's children with really difficulty feeding, um, it's apparent that they have um, decreased consciousness or interactivity. Uh, low muscle tone, um, can even have a kind of structural malformations of the brain, particularly hydrocephalus where um, there's increased pressure in the brain that can require a shunt. Um, some babies have, have difficulty breathing related to the, to the brain um, manifestations. Um, and then with the, the milder manifestations of MT, they're the milder end of the spectrum of MTHFR that may be developmental delays, uh, seizures later in life, um, Peripheral neuropathy, so um, loss of the uh, conduction of signals from the spinal cord uh, to the muscles and um, um, also impacting sensation um, and walking abnormalities related to that, spasticity or stiffness as well. So uh, on to the first set of recommendations. So these are uh, considered to have moderate strength. Um, consider an inherited disorder of remethylation where neurologic, hematologic, and visual symptoms are seen together. So that trio is considered to be fairly specific and should, in and of itself, indicate uh, the, that the clinician should evaluate for a, uh, a remethylation disorder. Um, they also state that, um, that uh, diagnostic studies should be considered when there are unexpected thrombosis and or spinal cord degeneration and or atypical hemolytic uremic syndrome. So these are some of the rarer manifestations of these conditions, but they're also more specific. Um, 
So the, the recommendation is that any patients who meet these criteria should have immediate, urgent biochemical investigation to confirm the diagnosis. So what else, if you see those things that were just mentioned, what else should a clinician consider? Um, so both nutritional deficiencies of B12 and folate should be considered. Um, the absorption of vitamin B12 from the gut is very complicated, and uh, there are many steps involved. There, uh, there's an autoimmune disease called pernicious anemia uh, that causes B12 deficiency. Um, some acute exposures like nitrous oxide um, or uh, the antifolate medications that uh, are often used for cancer and autoimmune diseases can have um, can mimic some of the features of the remethylation disorders. Um, also, uh, iron deficiency, some chronic viral illnesses, um, some um, cancers, and then some other uh, mitochondrial disorders. Uh, lysinuric protein intolerance is a, a disorder of amino acid handling. Um, so all of those need to be considered. Um, and uh, so when a, when a clinician does an initial evaluation, what are they going to see with the remethylation disorders? What, what will distinguish that to them? Um, primarily, it will be, um, uh, so uh, this is in the setting of, of uh, a high homocysteine. So homocysteine is, is um, the first thing that should be done. Assuming the homocysteine is elevated, then how do you um, start to evaluate uh, in a more fine-grained fashion for um, exactly which remethylation disorder is present? Um, most of them, you will probably see anemia in the untreated versions of these disorders. In the combined cobalamin disorders, you have the elevation of the methylmalonic acid, but not in the isolated remethylation disorders. In all cases, you have low methionine, so that will distinguish it from uh, cystathionine beta synthase deficiency or classical homocysteinuria. Um, the vitamin B12 level in the body is normal, which distinguishes it from uh, vitamin B12 deficiency or malabsorption. Um, and similarly, the folate level is normal, which distinguishes it from a dietary folate deficiency. So that's all summarized in this, um, in this algorithm that a clinician can work through. Um, I won't uh, spend any more time on it other than to say uh, if it's relevant to you, this is a, a really nice uh, diagram to, to work through if you're evaluating a patient for the clinicians out there. Um, so as I mentioned, the uh, total homocysteine is the first metabolite to measure when you suspect these disorders. Um, it's really important to, to tell um, metabolic and genetic physicians that even though homocysteine is an amino acid, it's not uh, well identified on the serum amino acid panel um, for kind of technical reasons. Um, so uh, we'll, uh, we'll get into that in a minute, but um, there's also a, a test available called free homocysteine which should be avoided. So um, the goal would be to send a total homocysteine um, in addition to your, uh, to your other testing that you're doing. Um, if you identify a, an elevated homocysteine, the next steps would be methylmalonic acid, methionine, which is typically done in the setting of just a panel of serum amino acids, and then measuring the B12 and uh, folate levels. Um, once you feel like you've worked through that flowchart and you've arrived at a suspected diagnosis, um, you can directly assay the enzymes um, MTHFR, MTHFD1, uh, methionine synthase, methionine synthase reductase. Um, this is getting a little outdated, um, <laughs> even though it was published last year, although it depends on where you are in the world. Um, Realistically, I would say most, most people, um, at least the, in terms of the folks whose practice I'm familiar with, um, once, the, uh, once the suspicion is there with the kind of immediate biochemical studies that you can get back in a day or two, uh, you would probably go immediately to genetic testing rather than doing the enzyme testing. So um, the molecular genetic or DNA testing really is the gold standard. Um, in almost all cases, you're going to want to identify the uh, specific mutations that your patient with a remethylation disorder has. Um, to some degree, you can do uh, what's called genotype-phenotype correlation, and you can give patients additional prognostic information beyond just what the diagnosis is uh, based on the specific mutation that's present. Um, there's also um, there's a huge literature on uh, what's called polymorphism in uh, the MTHFR gene, 
Um, these are quite prevalent in the population. So in some parts of the world, uh, a third of the population has two copies of the same polymorphism. Um, that can lead to uh, mildly elevated uh, homocysteine, which may be kind of a mild risk factor for some, some disorders, um, but that's really not, it's not a metabolic block, it's not a rare disease, it's not something that we manage in our metabolic clinic. We often get um, referrals uh, with uh, patients who have these polymorphisms identified for other reasons, um, but that's really not something that we do uh, in our clinic, and that's kind of the last that I'll mention it here. Um, so in terms of the uh, timely laboratory diagnosis, these are all moderate strength of evidence. Um, initial measurement should be total homocysteine. Really important to note that the handling of the blood sample uh, can really affect the homocysteine level. So if that uh, blood sample sits out at room temperature or, or if it's shipped at room temperature, you'll get a falsely low level. So you may miss um, a disorder of high homocysteine if um, the sample is not handled correctly. Um, free homocysteine is not, uh, is not a helpful measurement, so it should be total homocysteine. And then once that's identified, the next test is to measure methylmalonic acid, methionine, folate, and vitamin B12. We would like to do that before treatment is started because it's um, once you've given B12 injections, it's impossible to know if your patient had B12 deficiency because their levels will come up immediately with um, supplementation. So um, a couple other things to think about if the homocysteine level is elevated that are not genetic remethylation disorders. Um, that can be a B12 deficiency. Um, if you have a really severe uh, vitamin B6 deficiency, um, you can see that. Uh, if you have kidney failure, then you can have mildly elevated homocysteine. Um, and um, uh, so I will I'll leave it at that. So, but really, uh, if there's a significantly elevated homocysteine, um, especially in a child, you should really quickly be uh, moving into the thought process about which of these uh, remethylation or classical homocysteinuria conditions is present. Um, and these are all the um, the other things that were not the recommendations are not for these disorders, but these are the other things that will result in. Um, elevated homocysteine. So um, speaking of the genes, these are the names of all the genes um, that uh, make up the, the remethylation disorders. Um, in, in my clinical practice, I am moving to uh, really broad genetic testing really earlier and earlier in a diagnostic evaluation. So um, often I'm sending genetic testing before I ever send uh, biochemical testing. Um, I haven't yet identified one of these disorders on a, on a broad panel, but I really think that it's just a matter of time before the uh, genetic test really becomes the initial ascertainment of, of these disorders in, in more and more settings. It is uh, technically possible to do prenatal diagnosis. Um, it's really kind of a lab by lab um, decision in, in terms of whether they would accept amniotic fluid as a, a sample to measure homocysteine and methylmalonic acid. Um, much, more, um, much more preferred would be if you are um, seeing a family with a known uh, remethylation disorder, you would really prefer that there's a genetic diagnosis already made in an affected individual in the family, and then you could do prenatal testing on a chorionic villus sampling or on an amniocentesis um, to identify whether those mutations are present for the fetus rather than doing biochemical testing. I think everyone would, would feel more certain of, of that type of diagnosis. Um, so uh, a couple of additional recommendations. Um, diagnostic confirmation by molecular genetic testing or enzyme assays is recommended. Um, and the testing of um, prenatal samples is uh, technically feasible, um, but it's uh, considered low quality evidence right now. Um, newborn screening is um, basically how we ascertain all of our uh, cobalamin C patients, so all of the patients that we follow in our clinic. And just to give you a sense, so we um, here in Denver, we cover a, a population of um, probably about 10 million uh, people in the Rocky Mountain region. Um, we, off the top of my head, I would say we follow about 
15 patients um, in our clinic with um, various remethylation disorders, and the majority of them are um, patients with cobalamin C. Um, and part of the reason for that is because it is identifiable on newborn screen. Um, all of the patients that I know of, other than a, a couple of adults, have been identified on newborn screen um, for, um, for cobalamin C. Um, in, in that case, as I mentioned, the metabolite that, that's being measured is the methylmalonic acid, which shows up on the newborn screen as something called C3 acylcarnitine. So that's um, in that blood spot um, that's done at 24 hours of life. That's a, a stable molecule. Um, and uh, so that's something that we feel like we are identifying pretty reliably. Um, it's much, much harder to um, measure a deficiency of something on a screening test as opposed to an excess of it. So um, looking for a methionine deficiency, you know, the homocysteine, which is in excess, is an unstable molecule. The methionine is a stable molecule, but um, the, there are a lot of difficulties around um, trying to identify when something is too low as opposed to too high. So um, low methionine is, is not great as a, a primary test for the remethylation disorder. So, the majority of our patients with isolated remethylation disorders, actually all of them, have been identified clinically and not on newborn screening, as opposed to the combined disorders where all the patients have been identified on newborn screening. Um, so um, we do feel that there is uh, an important impact of early identification and early treatment. Um, <clears throat> it's not clear that it impacts developmental outcomes or visual outcomes. Um, but we do feel that it reduces uh, the prevalence of thrombotic events, uh, the atypical hemolytic uremic syndrome, um, and other thrombotic microangiopathies. Um, and by doing that, improves survival. Um, so that's the justification for, for newborn screening of these disorders. So um, there's considered to be moderate evidence for uh, early treatment and early identification of patients with cobalamin C uh, because it improves survival corrects the hematologic abnormalities, may prevent the atypical hemolytic uremic syndrome and hydrocephalus, but there's unclear impact on the eye disease and the developmental outcomes. Um, so the specific recommendations uh, are that um, vitamin B12 should be measured prior to any treatment in cases identified by newborn screening. Uh, I would say about half of our patients that are identified with this particular metabolite elevated actually just have maternal B12 deficiency um, as opposed to a, a genetic disorder of B12 metabolism. Um, the primary uh, marker for the disease is called C3 acylcarnitine. Um, there's an experimental marker called C17. Um, that's not part of our newborn screen here, but it is something that people are looking into. Um, having identified a patient with an elevated C3, the next, the next step would be to measure total homocysteine and methylmalonic acid to figure out whether you are um, managing an isolated methylmalonic acidemia or a combined disorder um, with hyperhomocysteinemia and uh, methylmalonic acidemia. And then if a patient is identified with MTHFR deficiency, um, we strongly recommend treatment with betaine to prevent severe neurologic impairment. We'll talk about that in more detail. Uh, in a little bit. Um, so what's the course of the disease uh, in the combined remethylation defects? Um, the hematologic issues uh, nearly completely resolve uh, with B12 treatment. Um, there is uh, still a risk uh, to the kidneys and to the lungs with the thrombotic microangiopathy, but it appears to be significantly decreased with treatment. Um, the uh, risk of thromboembolic complications, um, clotting, uh, is significantly reduced with treatment. Um, and uh, so for those reasons, um, the early identification and treatment of cobalamin C has decreased mortality. Um, so it's recommended, given the risk of the hemolytic uremic syndrome, that um, patients are monitored for renal disease, including by blood pressure. Um, there's considered to be low evidence for that, so that's something that people can consider, um, but probably not standard of practice. Um, and then the incidence of vascular complications is significantly reduced with appropriate treatment um, and may be prevented, um, and there's considered to be moderate evidence for that. So um, 
the course of, of disease, um, as we've talked about, is um, one with uh, some cognitive uh, changes. Uh, seizures are also potential um, uh, psychiatric symptoms. Uh, if you look at uh, brain imaging, um, you can see um, white matter injury to the spinal cord. Um, the seizure patterns are not specific to cobalamin C, so they are, um, there's not a specific seizure type that's present. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll show you some imaging of the MRI so you can see some of the, the brain MRI changes that are present in cobalamin C disease. Um, looking at a, a brain MRI image, this is, um, from, I believe, from a publication that um, James Weisfeld Adams uh, put out a couple years ago. A couple things to point out that, that may be present in a patient with cobalamin C disease are a thin corpus callosum. So the corpus callosum is the connection between the two sides of the brain. Um, and then a short pons. So the pons is this round part of the brain stem um, that may be shorter than is typical in, in patients with cobalamin C. Um, likewise, the, uh, the eye findings uh, in cobalamin C are, are fairly um, reproducible and fairly specific in the disease. This is an infant, uh, and um, this is uh, what's called a, a bullseye maculopathy. So um, you can see just a, a little bit of flattening of the, the center of the retina. That's the part of the retina that has the highest visual acuity. <coughs> Um, over the course of a couple of years, um, that uh, area of, of atrophy um, really expands and that, that correlates with declining visual acuity. If you look at an adult, um, you can see this really pronounced area uh, of atrophy in the retina surrounded by um, pigmentary changes um, centrally as well as pigmentary changes throughout the retina. So what you're looking at here is a, a camera that's been held up um, to the pupil of a, an individual with cobalamin C, and these are pictures that are taken of the retina or the back of the eye. Um, you can also employ some more advanced techniques to um, follow the progression of eye disease in folks with cobalamin C. So this is again from a, a publication from uh, James Weisfeld Adams, um, and he showed that you can use a technique called ocular coherence tomography to show the area of the retina with more specificity um, that is experiencing that, that thinning and atrophy. So there's considered to be low quality evidence um, because there's not a um, specific intervention that you would put in place, but um, knowledge and awareness of, of visual dysfunction allows timely initiation of appropriate visual intervention programs and support. And we recommend that patients newly diagnosed with a remethylation disorder should receive ophthalmologic consultation um, regardless of when they're diagnosed. Um, so, um, in, in some cases, uh, the isolated remethylation disorders can occasionally have some of the uh, more systemic complications of cobalamin D, but as I mentioned, they're um, really, for the most part, uh, neurologic and hematologic conditions. <coughs> um, MTHFR deficiency. Um, the vast majority of patients have the early onset form of the condition. Um, so they have um, relatively uh, severe developmental delays and seizures um, early in infancy that can lead to uh, apnea, which can be fatal. Um, the rare late onset version of the, of the disorder looks a little bit different, as I previously mentioned. Um, prenatal treatment has been considered for uh, some of the remethylation disorders. Um, so in very rare cases, um, mothers who uh, have a, a fetus that is known to be affected um, may themselves be treated even though the mother is not affected. So um, there's a, a case report of a mother who was treated with hydroxocobalamin um, who had a, a fetus with um, a known diagnosis of cobalamin C. <coughs> um, the authors of that paper did feel like they could uh, demonstrate biochemical improvement, and um, they showed that the, the sibling who was treated prenatally um, did not suffer some of the microangiopathic complications of the older sibling who was not treated prenatally. Um, 
That said, the, the evidence is, is very scant because this is, has not been done in very many cases. Um, so um, typically, uh, as I mentioned, these conditions present chronically with slowly progressive symptoms. Occasionally, there are um, acute deteriorations. Um, and particularly in cobalamin C disease, uh, there are folks that can have um, sudden, um, really severe manifestations in the kidneys and the lungs. <coughs> um, so uh, right now there's low evidence, uh, low quality evidence for prenatal treatment, although that's something that, be, that could be considered and um, maybe could be offered to, to families. Um, if there is a suspected case, so for example, if there's a, a family that um, chooses not to have prenatal diagnosis, but there's an a infant born who's known to have a 25% risk of one of these disorders, uh, our typical practice would be to treat until we've excluded the, the disease. So we start treatment even though there's only a 25% risk and we would stop treatment if um, the genetic testing revealed that the, the condition is not present. Um, particularly um, because the, the early treatment with MPHFR deficiency um, is uh, pretty dramatic, uh, we do recommend uh, there's moderate evidence for betaine treatment as soon as hyperhomocysteinemia is identified um, with normal or low methionine. Um, and uh, folinic acid and methionine can be considered, but again, there's low evidence, low quality evidence for those particular supplementations, so that, that's still a matter of debate. Um, Long-term management um, is uh, mainly derived from individuals with cobalamin C because that's the most common. Um, and uh, the management of uh, the other isolated uh, remethylation disorders of cobalamin is, is basically just modeled on the experience with cobalamin C. Um, the goal of treatment is to improve the clinical features of the condition, to change the natural history of the disorder, and uh, ultimately have a better outcome for the patient. Um, in terms of metabolic abnormalities, the goals are to reduce homocysteine, normalize the methionine, and in the combined disorders to uh, normalize the methylmalonic acid. Um, so the, the primary treatment of cobalamin C uh, is cobalamin supplementation. Uh, we recommend hydroxocobalamin as opposed to cyanocobalamin, both because it appears to be more effective and there's uh, less potential toxicity. Um, B12 can be taken by mouth, although um, you can achieve much higher doses in the body if it's given uh, subcutaneously or intramuscularly. Um, IV administration is an option for a hospitalized patient, but um, it's not a situation where you would uh, place a, a surgical line in someone in order to do IV treatment. Um, the typical treatment is one milligram in an infant, um, so that's uh, 300 micrograms per kilo per day in an infant of a typical weight, and then um, we would weight adjust that treatment as the patient's uh, age to, to maintain a similar dose for their weight. Um, the other disorders uh, have a little bit less um, evidence for them because there are fewer patients, but what evidence we do have seems to indicate that there is benefit of treating the other uh, remethylation cobalamin disorders with hydroxocobalamin. Um, this is that uh, most of our patients inject themselves or their families inject them in the thighs. Um, this is just showing that um, rather than um, going down into the muscle, we actually just have our patients do a subcutaneous injection that's um, significantly less painful for them. Um, the hydroxocobalamin is, uh, is commercially available, but the concentrations that are commercially available, at least where we are, um, mean that the, um, as patients get out of the neonatal period, the volume that you would be injecting would be um, too high. So we, uh, we use sterile compounding pharmacies to make special um, high concentration forms of hydroxocobalamin so that we're limiting the volume that's being injected. And, and that helps to reduce the discomfort for children. Um, betaine is, is really a mainstay, as I mentioned, of the treatment for MTHFR, um, but we typically use it in all of the conditions that, um, that cause hyperhomocysteinemia. Um, a typical dose would be 250 
milligrams per kilogram per day. Um, sometimes higher doses are used, although there's some debate about whether um, folks can absorb higher doses than this. Um, it has been used in pregnancy um, for patients that need it, um, and no neonatal adverse effects have been reported. Betaine is a really interesting molecule. So um, we have this enzyme in the body, betaine homocysteine methyltransferase, um, and uh, it's, it's present in the body, but as far as we know, it doesn't have any function unless you're supplemented with betaine. Um, so it's this nice kind of side road that we have in this pathway um, that we can take advantage of by, by supplementing people with, with betaine. Um, by giving the betaine, we both reduce homocysteine and increase methionine. Um, in cystathionine beta synthase, the methionine is already high, so um, the uh, methionine can sometimes limit the dose of betaine that, that you're giving. In all, of, in all of the remethylation disorders and MTHFR deficiency, um, in practice, you really can't get significantly elevated uh, levels of methionine, so that doesn't limit the dose of betaine the way it does in classical homocysteinuria. Um, side effects of both of these disorders are really uh, rarely reported. Hydroxocobalamin, it's mainly related to the injection site. Um, and long-term follow-up, um, betaine has been in, in use for quite a while, um, and it appears to be quite safe for patients. Um, as I mentioned, sometimes the methionine levels can be limiting in terms of the dose of homocysteine in classical homocysteinuria. Folate supplementation is, is often used for these patients. There's less evidence for that. Um, there are several forms of folate that can be given. There's um, just folate, which is uh, present in fortified grains. There's folinic acid. Um, there is uh, methylfolate. Um, there's some debate about which of these forms is, is most effective. Folinic acid seems to be the most stable, seems to get into the brain, which is something that we care about if we're uh, treating a disorder with neurologic manifestations. Um, in the majority of reports, however, it's folic acid that's been used. So um, this is something that's still a, a matter of study. Um, another drug that's really commonly used in metabolic disorders is called carnitine. Um, carnitine is a, a small molecule that um, attaches itself to, to any uh, organic molecule that's present in excess in the body. I shouldn't say any, but many uh, organic molecules. Uh, and it helps the body to excrete them. So um, dosing with carnitine uh, seems to help um, the body excrete the methylmalonic acid in cobalamin C and the other combined disorders. Uh, it is, at least in our clinic, it is typically prescribed for patients, um, although um, it has not been reported to have a, a significant long-term beneficial effect. Um, there's no clear consensus. Um, for our other metabolic disorders where we use it, um, a 50 milligram per kilogram per day dose would be on the low end. 200 milligrams per kilogram per day would be a very high dose. Um, dietary management, it's important to note that um, for the other um, non-cobalamin uh, C disorders of methylmalonic acidemia, uh, dietary management is really a cornerstone. Uh, we do a, a significantly protein-restricted diet, um, and we use medical foods to uh, achieve kind of a specific amino acid mixture. However, um, because methionine is a precursor for methylmalonic acid, that would be restricted in the non-cobalamin C methylmonic acidemias, but low methionine is likely a contributor to some of the uh, manifestations of cobalamin C. Um, so therefore, um, protein-restricted diets are not recommended for patients with cobalamin C because of the risk of lowering the methionine levels. Um, uh, Methionine and cysteine supplementations have been considered. Those are typically not needed to maintain normal levels of those amino acids. Um, and there's uh, generally low quality and, and sparse evidence for, um, for using that. So um, the only high quality evidence here in terms of medications and diet is that we strongly recommend uh, injectable hydroxocobalamin for treating cobalamin C and other cobalamin-related remethylation disorders. The low-quality evidence um, is for the specific dose. Um, 
and uh, for betaine treatment in cobalamin C, um, and for maintaining uh, the minimal effective betaine dose um, and uh, measuring homocysteine and methionine while treating with betaine. Um, there is um, moderate evidence for not restricting protein in cobalamin C. So unlike our other methylmalonic acidemia patients, these patients are not on a, a special diet. Um, and uh, there's low quality evidence for these other recommendations. Uh, so we really don't know. The jury's still out on use of folinic acid. Um, similarly, the jury's out on carnitine. Um, and uh, the jury is out on uh, oral methionine supplementation. Um, in MTHFR deficiency, so cobalamin C, um, hydroxycobalamin is really the cornerstone of treatment. MTHFR deficiency is betaine. Um, so treating with betaine is, is really the only, um, the, the real standard of care here and the, the real high quality evidence is around treating with betaine. Um, so there's a publication in 2014 showing that betaine supplementation was clearly associated with increased survival in MTHFR deficiency. The earlier the treatment was started, the better the patients did. Um, there's some evidence for use of folic or folinic acid in MTHFR deficiency. Um, there is, uh, again, the jury's out on um, using some other supplements like vitamin B6, cobalamin, riboflavin, and carnitine. Um, also some debate about methionine. So um, high quality evidence for use of betaine as early as possible in MTHFR deficiency. Um, and um, uh, again, the jury's still out on the other supplements in MTHFR. Um, importantly, we, uh, we give our patients uh, general anesthesia precautions. Um, so nitrous oxide, N2O, also known as laughing gas, is an inhibitor of methionine synthase. Um, all of the disorders that we talk about already uh, entail an inhibition of methionine synthase. So because of that, we really don't want to further inhibit that enzyme. So we recommend against the use of laughing gas or nitrous oxide for all of our patients. Um, one alternative is uh, propofol. So propofol is a, an anesthetic agent that can be used um, as a very quick onset and offset of action. So that's kind of an alternative to nitrous oxide for those kind of quick procedures. So high quality evidence strongly recommend against the use of nitrous oxide in these disorders. Um, management of pregnancy uh, has been uh, quite infrequent in these disorders, although there are a few reported cases of women with cobalamin C. Um, it makes sense to optimize the, <clears throat> the biochemical control. Um, one woman has uh, retrospectively been identified as having had cobalamin C after her child flagged on newborn screen for low carnitine. Um, and uh, in one pregnancy, um, aspirin was used as an anti-clotting agent, um, given that um, pregnancy is a risk factor for, for clots. So um, this is a patient with cobalamin C who's followed in our clinic. Um, his uh, parents gave us permission to use his picture and uh, just a, a nice reminder of um, the, the great patients that we take care of. Um, so I'm happy to, to take any questions now. I have a question if that's Okay, it's Nadine Borelovitz from Australia. Hi there. Hi, Dr. Larson. Thank you. That was really, really helpful. Um, I have a daughter who's two and a half years old with CBLC. Um, uh -huh. C is 7 one dupe a mutation. Um, uh -huh. She was diagnosed through newborn screening, and she's under the care of Professor Bridget Wilkin. Uh -huh. um, what I'm very interested in is... Um, You've obviously comparatively got, you've got a lot of patients that you, you've got in clinic. Um, I don't know anyone else in Australia <laughs> um, with CBLC. And um, yeah. one of the things I wanted to know was um, it seems like for whatever reason, um, the developmental delays and the eye deterioration seem to be almost, well, this is what my question is, 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 is it an inevitability despite treatment or not, and I was wondering in your experience with those 15 patients or whoever has CBLC, if, um, 
how those kids have been doing who've been diagnosed through newborn screening in those respects and also um, if they are doing well, what do you think is keeping them in check? Yeah, so that's, a, that's a great question. I don't have all the um, mutations off, off the top of my head. Um, there definitely are genotype-phenotype correlations. Um, so um, there are certain mutations that are more likely to result in uh, developmental delay and more likely to result in visual impairment than others. Um, I would say in the experience with our patients, that's probably the primary factor that's um, differentiating those with developmental delays and visual impairment from those that, that don't have those manifestations. Um, certainly in terms of early treatment, um, I, I know before I was uh, here in our clinic, um, many years ago there was a patient who had kind of a, a significant crisis with the um, thrombotic microangiopathy, um, but I have, I have not seen that. Um, so um, certainly the, the evidence from the literature um, and, uh, you know, my experience more recently in this clinic would, would indicate that the uh, the treatments that we typically use um, do seem to significantly lower the incidence of the um, thrombotic microangiopathy, um, clotting events, and um, the hematologic compl complications of, of covalency. Okay, thank you. Sure. Hi, my name is Reed. Um, I've got a three-month-old here next door in New Mexico with Cabalamin C. Um, Hi there. My question would be, can you comment on the prospects for gene therapies in the near future? Um, that's a great question. I, I don't know the specifics um, with regards to Cabalamin C. Does it, um, I don't know if anyone else is on the call who, um, who knows of any specifics. Um, but I can I can speak a little bit more generally um, with respect to our um, with respect to a number of, of metabolic conditions. Um, it um, <clears throat> it seems to me that the conditions that are uh, clearly treatable with um, with liver transplant um, are kind of the the wave of gene therapy trials that are are coming through um, that I'm seeing. So. Um, those are like urea cycle defects and, and some, um, uh, you know, maybe being, being closer on, on some of the isolated organic acidemias. Um, certainly there's a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of research in um, gene therapy with respect to eye diseases. Um, so I, you know, I honestly don't know, but um, it's certainly plausible to me that um, given how much, uh, you know, how much gene therapy research is, is happening with respect to eye diseases that that, you know, that might be a target, certainly. Does anyone, does anyone on the call have um, uh, any uh, thoughts on, on that question? Um, it's Nadine again. <laughs> um, I had spoken to um, an eye doctor here who specializes in general eye diseases, and one of the things, it wasn't what I wanted to hear, but what he said the difficulty is going to be with CBLC patients is it's fundamentally, with, with, when they look at genetic treatment, gene, gene therapy treatment on eyes, it's generally the gene therapy directly into the eyes because of a particular issue, whereas here you've got to assess the cellular level and that it might be more complicated to have gene therapy where it's because of something that's happening throughout all the cells in the body as opposed to something that's just happening in the eyes. So, I don't know. Yeah, that's, that. a, that's a really good point. And, you know, my, my understanding is that we don't, um, we still don't have a great um, uh, understanding of what the, what the actual pathogenesis of the eye disease is. Um, <laughs> So yes, I, that's a, a, a point well taken. Yeah. Thank you.
Dr. Larson, I've got another question, please, if I may. Sure, go ahead. Um, I was just curious to know what you would regard as high levels of homocysteine and MMA and um, low levels of um, good levels of methionine. So my daughter, she's doing extremely well. She's scared to comment because she is one of the kids that's doing really well. Um, but her homocysteine levels have generally been in the 40s and her MMA levels in the 20s and 30s. And when I do speak to people in America, it seems like their levels are quite significantly lower than hers, but her methionine is in the 30s to 50s. And I was just wondering if you, what you, what you thought of those levels. Um, I would say that that kind of jives with with my experience with our patients. Um, you know, the the homocysteine levels <clears throat> in cobalamin C um, are unlikely to normalize, um, and the uh, methylmalonic acid levels are unlikely to normalize. Um, but uh, you know, for example, in uh, classical homocysteinuria. Um, you know, we know that the, the risk of thrombotic complications drops really significantly as you get, you know, kind of below 50 um, in your um, in your homocysteine. Um, so, yeah, I would I would say that uh, you know what you've seen sounds like kind of the ballpark that most of our patients are in. Um, you know, we don't we don't have that much evidence, but we we definitely feel that having maintaining Lower methylmonic acid levels is, is protective to the kidneys. Um, so, you know, lower is better, um, but, uh, you know, we haven't seen, um, we haven't seen the kind of renal manifestations in cobalamin C that we see in our patients with the isolated uh, methylmonic acid di uh, disorders that have much higher levels. So with MMA in the 20s and 30s to you, does that sound okay or is that a bit high? Um, that's, uh, you know, that's typically about what we can achieve with um, hydroxocopalamin dosing. Um, so, uh, you know, we sometimes will, you know, we'll go up much higher, you know, the, the doses for some patients uh, end up significantly higher than that kind of recommendation of uh, 300 to 600 micrograms per kilogram per day, but um, we don't see that much change in the methylmalonic acid level as we get to higher doses. So, um, you know, that's typically what you're describing is, is typically what we have found that we can achieve with our current treatment. Um, and those level, you know, the patients that with isolated methylmalonic acidemia that are needing kidney transplants in their, say, in their teens or in early adulthood, they, you know, often have methylmalonic acid levels of 300 or 400. So it's kind of an, okay. it's an order of magnitude different in uh, cobalamin C as opposed to the, you know, isolated methylmalonic acidemia where you really see the early onset kidney disease. Yeah. What was interesting is we actually doubled her dose. We got a blood test every three months, and we doubled because we were below recommendation, recommended guidelines with the B12 uh, hydroxycobal, and we doubled uh -huh. the dose. We saw no difference in the results the following month. If anything, they were slightly worse. Yeah. Was, uh, sorry, in the following three months period, yeah. which was we were shocked that you know I expected homocysteine to drop all the way you know below 20, and it was still in the 40s. Yeah, I, and I would say that's been our recommendation. That's been our experience as well. That um, you know we haven't really seen benefit in going above the recommended doses. There, there seems to be a, um, you know diminishing returns. So I think we're you know with the the recommended uh, doses, we we seem to be getting you know all the enzyme activity that we can. This is Danae, and I, I wanted to jump back to the conversation about um, the gene editing, and I, I don't, it's not particular a comment in regards to gene editing, but it's about research in general, um, and Austin, just so you know, we can still see your screen, so your email's up there for the world to see, <laughs> um, but one of the things I wanted just to comment on, um, 
So I'm closely tied to a lot of metabolic communities just because I think we have a lot in common that we can share with each other. And I was at a uh, PKU conference here where one of um, the, I can't remember exactly where she falls, she works in Carrie Harding's lab in uh, Oregon. And essentially what she reminded us of is that with any research and anything that's happening, she's specifically working on gene editing, that things don't happen in these giant leaps. It's a bunch of little successes that get us to these better treatments and better cures. And that's something I think we just have to be cognizant of when we're, we're frustrated that things aren't moving along faster. Because she said, you know, it can be the tiniest thing, but it's the biggest success to them because they've been working on it for months and months. So I think it's just something that as a patient and as caregivers that we need to be aware of so that way we don't end up frustrating ourselves because it, it, uh, it does take time. And sometimes those things that are so small are the most complicated things. And then once they make that breakthrough, it's so much easier to go for. Yeah, just to to echo on that, um, you know, there, there's really a, a, a lot of uh, gene therapy research going on right now, and the uh, um, experience that people are having with different vectors and, um, you know, different types of genes that are able to be introduced into those vectors and different ways of introducing them into the body, whether it's intraocular or, you know, targeting the liver or, or whatever the, the situation may be, you know, each of those developments and each of those improvements is um, something to build on. So um, I would, I would uh, absolutely agree with that, that um, it's really an active area of research and um, even, uh, you know, things that are, are totally unrelated, even things that are unrelated to metabolic disorders, let alone, um, you know, cobalamin disorders, um, are going to have an impact in, in some way. We just, you know, don't know exactly which, which, uh, you know, which leaps forward are, are going to be relevant to this particular set of diseases. Mm -hmm. I think that's a good point because sometimes our, the, the breakthroughs are in areas that people aren't expecting them and then they apply to something else. So <laughs> sometimes we get those unexpected uh, breakthroughs. All right. Is there any other questions that anyone else has at this time? All right. Um, well, I would like to thank Austin for filling in for Dr. James Weisfield Adams. Um, my name is Danae. I'm the Executive Director of HCU Network America. Um, and so I just really appreciate you, Austin, stepping up and um, filling in and providing us with this information and this in-depth look at. I know for some it might just be an overview, but I thought it was very thoroughly presented. Um, and if you have any follow-up questions after this webinar, please feel free and email our organization and I can uh, forward them to um, either James or to Austin. Um, and our email address is hcunetworkamerica at gmail.com. But um, I'm going to stop the recording. So thank you everyone for attending. We really appreciate it. And you, we hope that you'll join us for future webinars.